All right, hello everyone. This is a video for the solutions to the Unit 2 Practice Exam Version 2. This version will be a little bit closer to what you'll expect to find on a Unit 2 test coming up. So question one is a question that I, I guess you could say encompasses most of what this unit uh, dealt with. We have section 3.1. For this question, this one was 3.2. This section was 3.3. Um, graphing the function itself was section uh, 3.7, I believe. So there's a lot of topics covered here in this question. So for part A, to find intervals of which a function is increasing and decreasing, we need the first derivative. So the first derivative of our function there is going to be 3x squared minus 12x plus 3. Next step is to take that first derivative and set it equal to 0. Because remember, the, the, the process is to find the critical numbers. The critical numbers are the numbers in which the first derivative equals 0 or that make the first derivative undefined. So we set the first derivative equal to zero. Um, I've noticed that all three terms here are divisible by three, so I'm gonna go ahead and factor out a three. That leaves x squared minus four x plus one equals zero, and then I'm gonna divide by the three. So that leaves us with this expression, or this equation rather, x squared minus 4x plus 1 equals 0. Now we've done a few problems that look like this, and at this point we've been left with a quadratic expression that factors. Unfortunately this one is not factor. So the other way to solve a quadratic equation is with the quadratic formula. So if you don't recall the quadratic formula, it's the opposite of b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4 AC all over 2a. This is the quadratic formula. <clears throat> so using that formula, gives us 4 plus or minus the square root of 12 all over 2. Now, if the point of this were to find solutions to a quadratic equation, like in a 1050 class or a 1010 class, you would take the time to simplify that square root of 12 into two square roots of three and try to simplify this expression into a more simple form. Um, all we're really trying to do are find the critical numbers. And the easiest way to do this for us is gonna be in decimal form. So I'm not even gonna bother about uh, trying to simplify the square root of 12. Um, I'm gonna do four plus the square root of 12 And that turns out to be 7.46. Then I'm going to divide that by 2, and I get 3.73. So one of the answers is 3.73. Now I'm going to do 4 minus the square root of 12. And that's 0.53. Then I'm going to divide that by 2, and I get 0.27. So those are two of the critical numbers. Okay. And if you recall, once we have critical numbers, no matter how many critical numbers there are, they're placed on a number line. And you choose test points. And uh, something smaller than 0.27, I'm going to test a value of 0. And then in between 0.27 and 3.73, I'm going to test a value of 1. And then something greater than 3.73, I'm going to test a value of 4. So those, these values here, the 0, the 1, and the 4, those are going to be my test points. Those test points are going to be tested in the first derivative right there. So if I plug in a 0 into the first derivative, I'm going to end up with a positive 1. That's a positive number. So I'm going to, know I'm going to put a plus there. If I plug in a 1 
into the first derivative, I'm going to get 1 minus 4 plus 1, which is a negative number, so I know that this interval is negative. Now if I plug in a 4 into the first derivative, I'm going to get 16 minus 16 plus 1, which is a positive number. And this positive number here tells me that that interval from negative infinity to 0.27, so from negative infinity to 0.27, and this interval here from 0.37, or 3.73 rather, so 3.73, those plus signs let me know that the function is increasing because those plus signs indicate a positive slope tangent line and a, a function has a tangent line with a positive slope anywhere that is increasing. Now from 0.27 to 3.73 the function is decreasing. Now part B is going to be a direct result from part A if we look at this number line test here, any time the function switches from increasing to decreasing like it does here, or when it switches from decreasing to increasing like it does here, that indicates a relative extreme. So this part where it switches from increasing to decreasing means that at that point the graph has reached a high point in that area. So we know there's a relative max at the point, point 0.27 comma now this is where a y value would go because this is an x value we need a y value to find a y value paired up with an x value you need to use the original function so going back here if you plug in a point 0.27 so let me go ahead and do this Plug in a 0.27, you get 10.39. Now this, where this function switches from decreasing to increasing, indicates that the, uh, the function has hit a low point or a relative minimum. And the x value is 3.73. We got to find the matching y value. So again, we go back to the original function and plug in 3.73 for all of those. It turns out we get negative 10.39. Now that's just a coincidence. These aren't always going to be opposite numbers. Now for part C, find all intervals in which the function is concave up and concave down. So I'm going to do part C over here. So concavity uh, needs to be found from the second derivative, so f double prime. We'll go back to our original form of the first derivative here. If we, if we, if we take a derivative of that derivative, we're going to get 6x minus 12. And then set that equal to 0. And solve that, we get x equals 2. So this is much like the test we did for part B, where we put it on a number line. This is the critical value of the second derivative. And now we need to choose test points on either side. So I'm going to test 0, and I'm going to test 3 into the second derivative. If I plug in 0, I'm going to get negative 12, so that's a negative number. If I plug in 3, I'm going to get positive 6, so that's positive. So this negative sign here indicates on that interval from negative infinity to 2, the graph is concave down. And from 2, I'll write that a little better. From 2 to infinity, the graph is concave up. And then because the concavity switches, there's an inflection point at the point 2. That's an x value. Now we're searching for a y value, so we need to go back to the original function. 
and plug in a 2 for all the x's. So let me go ahead and plug in a 2. And we are going to get 0. which we could have seen from right there. If you plug in a two right there, you'd get a zero. So two comma zero is our inflection point. So that would be the answer to part D. So we have part E remaining, and I'm running out of room, so I'm gonna draw my graph right here. So going back up to the original forms of the functions, it says, remember to find and label all intercepts. That's x and y intercepts. So I gave you the factored form in order to help you find the zeros or x-intercepts. So we're going to have an x-intercept at negative 1, positive 2, and positive 5. And then to find a y-intercept, you let x equal 0. So if you plug x equals, if you plug a 0 in for all of these x's, you'd have a positive 10. Okay. And the original function is a third-degree polynomial. The end behavior of a third-degree polynomial with a positive leading coefficient is left side is going down, right side is going up. Now, labeling some of these other points we found, um, there's relative max of 0.27 comma 10.39, so that's right about here. And there's a relative max. There was a relative min at 3.73 comma negative 10.39, so that's right about here. And then we have our inflection point there already labeled because it's an x-intercept. So. Let's try that again. And I'm going to label this as 0.27 comma 10.39 relative min and max. Got everything else found. Now for part F, absolute extrema, um, the process for determining absolute extrema is you have to evaluate the function at the end points of the interval. So the interval was from 0 to 3, so I need to find F of 0 and I need to find F of 3. And then you also need to evaluate the function at any critical number. So the critical numbers that were found were right here, 3.73 and 0.27. Now, 3.73 is outside of the interval 0 to 3. So we don't really need to worry about evaluating at 3.73. So I need to find f of 0.27. Now, we already know that f of 0 is going to equal 10. That was our y-intercept right here. And we know that f of 0.27 is 10.39. That was just our relative max right here. So we just need to find f of 3. So if we plug in a 3 for all of the variables in the original function, we will get, let's see, we got plus 3x. negative 8. Okay, so once you've evaluated all of these, whichever one has the highest value, that's your absolute max. Whichever one has the smallest value, that's your absolute min. So this one right here has the highest value, so our absolute max on that interval is a point, point two seven comma 10.39. And the absolute min on that interval is a point three comma negative eight.
All right, question two. Pretty much same type of question, just with a different kind of function. This rational function. So we'll start with part A. To find intervals on which the function is increasing and decreasing, we need the first derivative. So this is going to be a quotient rule. So you got to follow the, the rule that we learned back in chapter 2 for the, taking the derivative of a quotient. Now we simplify. So this will be 2x plus 2 minus 2x plus 4. 2x's would cancel there. So we have 2 plus 4, so we'd have a 6. over x plus 1 squared. Now, to find the intervals now, we take the first derivative and we find the critical numbers. Remember, the critical numbers are where the first derivative equals 0 or where the first derivative is undefined. Now, if we were to take this expression, and set it equal to 0, uh, we talked about this in class a few times. Uh, this kind of rational equation or rational expression is only going to equal 0 if the numerator equals 0. And 6 is never going to equal 0. So there are no values of x that make the function equal 0. But there are values of x that would make the denominator 0, which would be undefined. And that's x equals negative 1. So our critical numbers are negative 1. If we choose some test points on either side, like uh, a negative 2 and 0, if we, if we test those test points, if I plug in a negative 2, negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1 squared, is 1. 6 divided by 1 is positive, so it's increasing from negative infinity to negative 1. If I plug in a 0, a 0 plus 1 squared, which is 1. 6 divided by 1 is positive 6, so it's also increasing from negative 1 to infinity. So it's always increasing, but I can't include negative 1 in my interval because negative 1 is an undefined value in the function. So we'd have to separate this into two intervals. Because the function isn't switching from decreasing to increasing or increasing to decreasing, um, for part b, Part B it says find all relative extrema. There are none. There are relative extrema because we can see here from this number line test that the function doesn't switch, like I said, from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. And part C uh, points or intervals where the function is concave up or down, we need a second derivative. So that means we need to take the derivative of the first derivative there. Now to do that, let me erase this. Let me go back to the first derivative. So the first derivative I'm going to rewrite into a different form. I'm going to move the x plus 1 up to the numerator, give it a negative exponent. This will be easier to find a derivative. 
guess we can just use the power rule. And then technically it's a chain rule because we have an outside function and an inside function, so we would have to multiply it by the derivative of the inside function, but <coughs> multiplying by 1 isn't necessary. So there's the second derivative, and then we're going to go ahead and write it with the x plus 1 term in the denominator. And we need to do the same thing as we did in part A. We need to take that and set it equal to 0. And as in part A, this rational expression is never, never going to equal 0 because the numerator, negative 12, is never going to equal 0. So there aren't any critical numbers there for which it's equal to 0, but there are. there is a critical value uh, for which this is undefined, and it's the same value, x equals negative 1. So we can do another test here. If I plug in a negative... Well, let's see, we're going to have to test negative 2. So if I plug in a negative 2 right there for x, I'm going to get negative 2 plus 1, which is negative 1. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1, but negative 12 divided by negative 1 is positive. So it's concave up from negative infinity to negative 1. If I test something on this side of the number line, 0, for example, Plug in a 0 for x, 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 cubed is 1. Negative 12 divided by 1 is negative 12. So it's concave down from negative 1 to infinity. So from negative infinity to negative 1, it's concave up. From negative 1 to positive infinity, it's concave down. And there is a switch of, of uh, concavity at negative 1, and typically that would mean an inflection point. Uh, but there can be no inflection point at negative 1, because if you look at the original function, negative 1 is undefined. We can't plug in a negative 1 to find a y value. So there's no inflection point. Part E, the graph. Graphs of rational functions have asymptotes, most likely both vertical and horizontal. So the vertical asymptote is anywhere you have an undefined value. So if you look back, like I just mentioned, the undefined value of this function is negative 1. So there's going to be a vertical asymptote at negative 1, and the horizontal asymptote depends on the degree of the numerator compared to the denominator. The numerator is degree 1, the denominator is degree 1, and as we discussed in class, if the numerator and denominator have the same degree, then the horizontal asymptote is found by dividing the leading coefficients. So if we divide 2 by 1, I get 2, so the horizontal asymptote is up 2 units there. Now we find the x and y-intercepts. The y-intercept is found by letting all the x's equal 0. So if I plug a 0 in for that x and a 0 in for that x, we would get negative 4 over positive 1, which is negative 4. To find the x-intercept, we let y equal 0, or in this case, f of x. So if I want the whole function to equal 0, remember this type of function or equation equals 0 when the numerator equals 0. So we're solving the equation 2x minus 4 equals 0. That happens when x equals 2. Now we need to decide how the pieces of the graph 
fit together and we can use the information from part A and part C um, where it's increasing, decreasing. So according to this table, the function is increasing from negative infinity to negative 1, which means the graph has to look like that. That's an increasing piece from negative infinity to negative 1. It also has to be concave up according to that. So actually let me there we go. Now on the other side it says here that it's also increasing from negative 1 to infinity but it's got to be concave down. So this is an increasing concave down piece. So part F is asking for a limit that's approaching negative 1 from the positive. So that's approaching negative 1 from this direction. And as you see moving along the graph here, as we're traveling this direction towards negative 1, the graph is heading down towards negative infinity. So the answer to this, if we can find the answer just by looking on the graph, as we approach negative 1 from the right, we can see the graph keeps going down and down towards negative infinity. Now part G, another limit, it's the limit as x approaches positive infinity. So positive infinity is in this direction. The x just keeps getting larger and larger and larger. So we need to figure out what's happening on the graph as the x values keep getting larger and larger and larger. And f of x is going to get closer and closer and closer to our horizontal asymptote, which is positive 2. So this would be positive 2. All right, question 3. So part A is asking about a maximum profit. Now two words here, maximum, so we're going to have to take a derivative because we're going to need to maximize profit. But uh, profit, we don't have, we weren't given a profit function. Remember, this little lowercase p stands for price. That's the demand function. Um, and we've got cost. So a couple of things you need to remember. Price is revenue minus cost. And then also recall that revenue is x times demand. So we can find the revenue function by multiplying x by our demand function. And then we can find profit by taking that revenue function and subtracting cost so there's a function that defines profit in terms of x number of units so to maximize this we need to find the derivative So we would have negative 0.8x plus 200. And then in order to maximize or minimize, to optimize anything, to find the maximum this, to find the minimum that, first derivative, set it equal to zero, find the critical numbers, prove that it's an extreme, a relative extreme, and then figure out what you need to do the answer to answer the question from there. So and then to 
divide by 0 0.8, and x equals 250 units. Now we have to prove that that's a maximum. Right now, all we know is it's a critical number. So testing it on number line. Let's see if we can test something to the left, like something really small, positive one, for example. Whoops, not point one. Well, I guess we could do point one, but positive one. If we test positive one in there, we'd have 200 right here. Negative 0.8 times 1 plus 200, that's a positive number. If we tested something on this side, like uh, 1,000, for example. If we tested 1,000, plugged in 1,000 there, that's negative 800. Uh, plus 2 is a negative number. So this shows that the function is increasing to decreasing, which proves that 250 is a maximum value. So the value of x that yields a maximum profit is 250 units. But the question was what price yields a maximum profit. So for that, we need to go back to the price function here. So we know that there's 250 units that have to be sold, so the price, lowercase p, would be 280 minus 0.4 times 250. So that's 280 minus 100, which equals $180. So this was for part A. For part B, average cost what we discussed in class um, the average cost was total cost divided by x, number of units. Uh, so this is the total cost when the profit is maximized. And the profit is maximized when x equals 250 units. So we need to use the cost function, which is 80, where is it, 80x plus 120. all over x and just plug in 250 and uh, run it through your calculator. This would be 80 dollars and 48 cents per unit. Okay. The point of diminishing returns is a result of second derivative. It's an inflection point is what it is. We need to first find first derivative. So just take derivative of each term at a time. So the derivative of that first term, negative 2 thirds x cubed, you do coefficient times exponent. So that would be negative 2 x squared plus 16x. Do the second derivative, we have negative 4x plus 16. And now an inflection point is found by looking at concavity. So we need to set this equal to zero to find critical number. So negative 4x plus 16 would equal zero. 
when x equals 4, now we have to show that it's an inflection point by showing a change in concavity. So if we tested a 1 and a 5 in the second derivative, um, here we would get positive, and if we plug in a 5, we would get negative. So the graph switches from concave up to concave down, which shows the 4 is an inflection point. Um, we've got to remember 4 is in terms of thousands of dollars, so this doesn't mean x equals 4, this means x equals $4,000. So $4,000 is what should be spent on advertising costs. Okay, question five. We uh, we need to build a rectangular pig pen using a set amount of fencing. So that's going to be a perimeter. We have a perimeter of 500 feet of fencing. But what we need to do is find the largest possible area or maximize area. <clears throat> so we need to find the maximum area. Let's see if we can have a visual. So here's our existing stone wall, and the pig pen is going to be built using the stone wall as one of the sides, so we only need one, two, three. We need three sides of the fence. Now, the area inside is what we're trying to maximize, and the area of a rectangle is equal to length times width. So we have two lengths and a width, and length times that width would give us the area, but the problem is we can't find a prime if we have two different variables. So this would be our primary equation. This is the one that needs to be maximized. Um, the problems we've done that were like this were similar to this, where there were too many variables. What we needed to do is come up with a secondary equation to plug into the primary equation. So the secondary equation would use this bit of information given that the perimeter is 500 feet. Now the perimeter of a rectangle is the measure around the outside. And since it only has three sides, it's going to be two lengths plus the one width, and the perimeter is set at 500. So if I move the 2L over to the other side, I get W equals 500 minus 2L, and then I can plug that in for that W right there, and get that area is equal to length times 500 minus 2L. Simplify that to negative 2L squared plus 500L. Now I can find the first derivative, negative 4L plus 500. And if you want to maximize something, you got to set the first derivative equal to 0. So negative 4L plus 500 equals 0 means that L is 125 feet. So this is 125 feet, this is 125 feet. Together that makes 250 feet. And there's only 500 feet of fencing. So that means there's gonna be 250 feet left over for the width. And you know what I forgot to do? That I told you never to forget, we've gotta, I'm just assuming that that's the maximum. 125 feet at this point, all we know is a critical number. So we've gotta show that it is a D to maximum by doing this number line test. So I'm going to test one foot, then I'm going to test 500 feet. So if I plug in one foot into this first derivative here for length, I'm going to get a positive number. If I plug in 500 feet into that first derivative, I'm going to get a negative number. So that proves that 125 is a maximum, or would provide a maximum area. The question, though, was what dimensions should the farmer use? So it would be 125 feet by 250 feet. Those would be the dimensions of a rectangular pig pen that in this case would give the largest area or the maximum area. So, question six. This is from section 3.8. Um, didn't have a lot of time to talk about this and what a differential 
is, we'll spend more time with it in chapter 5. Um, for our intent and purpose for right now, we will just consider a practice finding a derivative. Because uh, essentially that's what it is. We need to find dy dx, which is the derivative, and then just move the dx to the end once we're finished. So uh, before we find the derivative, though, I'm going to rewrite this expression, or this equation, is going to be to a power of two-thirds. So now the derivative is just the chain rule. Then you subtract one from the exponent. And then you have the chain rule part, the derivative of the inside function. Then he can multiply the two thirds and the ten x. That's going to be twenty x over three. And five x squared minus two to the negative one third. And then we're going to separate the dy and the dx. I'm going to leave the dy on the left and multiply the dx to the other side. And this is what's known as the differential dy. Plus the 7, differentiate, Let's find y prime, or dy dx. So we've got a product. We also have an inside and out. So that's a chain rule with a product rule. So um, we can first use the product rule. So y prime, it's the derivative of the first function multiplied by the second function plus the derivative of the second function. So this is the derivative of the second function multiplied by the first function. And then I'm going to clean up this right side of the equation there. So I'm going to multiply the 3, the 8x, and the 5. So 8 times 5 is 40, and the 40 times 3 is 120. So that's 120. And then we're going to get x. Let's see, we're going to have x cubed. And then 4x squared plus 5 squared. <coughs> now, if you compare the left side and the right side on either side of that plus sign, you got to figure out what they both have in common. So, between 10x and 120x, you can factor out a 10x. And then they both have a 4x squared plus 5 to the second power, you always factor out the smallest exponent. So that's going to leave a 4x squared plus 5 to the first power left over from here. And then it's going to leave, from here it's going to leave, if you factor out a 10x from 120x, that's a 12x squared. So this 4x squared and that 12x squared in there can add together. So that's going to be 16x plus 5. Okay, number 8. Implicit differentiation. We take the derivative of the entire thing. Anytime you have matching variables, um, it's just normal differentiation, but anytime you've got mismatching, so the y and the x, that's where, that's where you need the dy dx term. 
So the derivative of 5x squared is just 10x. But the derivative of 5y squared is 10y dy dx. Now, this 3xy cubed term here is 3x multiplied by y cubed by the product rule. So we need to use a product rule similar to the last problem we did. So we need the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the derivative of the second function. Now this is 3y squared, and since it's a y variable with respect to x, we need 3y dx. That's the derivative of the second function multiplied by the first function. So let me clean this up a little bit. 10y dy dx plus 3y cubed plus now the 3y squared here and the 3x. I'm going to multiply those together into 9xy squared dy dx. Now I want to keep terms together that have a dy dx. So this 3y cubed I'm going to move over to the other side with the 10x by subtracting. So 10x minus 3y cubed equals now the 10y has a dy dx and the 9xy squared has a dy dx. So what that means on the right side is you can factor out the dy dx. And then divide by this term to get dy dx by itself. So 10x minus 3y cubed will be in the numerator. And 10y plus 9xy squared would be in the denominator.